The last page has been turned on my most recent read. Condensation is clinging to the side of my reusable water bottle. It's still just a bit too hot to faff with making anything else. And to be honest, I've probably had way too many cups of tea. And I am ready to tell you all about the book I've just finished. So here I am, no spoilers, opinion filled as always, and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer, and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. If you listen to this on release day, or even release week, then my holiday is so close I can taste it. But I can also see the horrific to-do pile on my work desk, and that's just a bit intimidating. It's been a pretty quiet week, apart from getting delivery of an Xbox One S with no power cable, a controller with a battery pack that doesn't close, and a TBR shelf that literally collapsed during my lunch break, as in crack. Oh look, my books are now all over the floor. I have done some reading. I am more than halfway through two books and parts of the future planning I talked about last week were actually emailed to me this week. So it's all good, unless you count the bookshelf. Anyway, this week is going to be a little different as, for the first time ever, I talk non-fiction. Yes, you didn't hear me wrong. I am talking non-fiction. When I first picked up this book a few months ago, I wasn't sure whether I was going to even get around to reading it. But the cover and the like I have for the writer persuaded me. Yes, I do have books I never read, or at least I put on the shelf and occasionally pick up with the intention of reading them, but never actually get around to it. So light a few candles or perhaps just switch on that tiny reading lamp because a bit of atmosphere is always a wonderful accompaniment to a reading session. Get yourself a glass of something chilled or a fresh cup of something hot, depending entirely on when you're listening and on your preference, of course. And let's get started. As I have already mentioned, this is non-fiction, but I can honestly say it's non-fiction that has been written with the reader in mind. It's funny at times, really heartbreaking at others, and really engaging. Put it this way, I picked it up as a this is on my August reading list, let's see if I can finish it book on Thursday night. And by 11.30, I had just 40 pages left to go. I finished it up Friday morning and put it down feeling things. This week's read is Delicacy, a memoir of cake and death by Katie Wicks. In Delicacy, award-winning writer and actor Katie Wicks writes of 21 moments that have defined her life, each one beginning with a memory of cake. The sickly royal icing marked the moment she found her voice. The Madeira cake was the sun her group therapy sessions orbited. The missing cake from a lost holiday has never let go. The supermarket rock cake was where she practiced wanting. Exquisitely written, Delicacy is about grief, addiction, love, loss and hope. It is shocking, raw, darkly funny and deeply humane. A fresh take on memoir from an astonishing new voice. I wasn't sure what I was going to get from this book, if anything at all. I just happened to like the author. I have found her engaging, amusing, talented and sometimes the only highlight in TV shows that I've seen her in and radio plays that I've listened to. She was Gemma in probably my favourite amateur sleuth show. She was the ditzy friend in Not Going Out and more recently she's been a ghost in Ghosts. But it seems that she was hiding a heck of a lot behind all those comedic roles and as I started to read... I realised that I really am not alone. This book picks 21 moments in Katie's life when Cake has played a part, whether it's as a friend or foe. There are stories that would horrify you, one of an assault of the worst kind, another of a car crash that nearly ended her life, 
and even more about the destructive relationship she develops with food because of childhood events. There were points in the book where I sat back and I thought, oh my God, this was me at school. Or I remember my mum saying something like this to me. The more I read, the more choked up I became. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not all doom and gloom or painful crying jags. There are the points where she talks about surviving, about getting better, about recovery. The memoir itself is punctuated with memories of cake, and they are almost poetic in the way that they're written. Katie Wicks knows how to express her thoughts and feelings and make them into something you have to read. It's really funny, but not in a laugh-out-loud way. In the first chapter, there's a moment I can identify with so clearly. It's something that has bugged me since I was 11 years old. The cycling proficiency exam. Anyone who's taken it will know. I failed. And recently I had this conversation with my mum wherein she told me that I did pass my cycling proficiency. When I have held anger about it for 36 years... Now, being a bit odd, I keep all my certificates in a folder. The cycling proficiency test one isn't there because I failed. Anyway, I digress. Katie is on holiday with her mum in Paris, still bitter about being the only person to fail the dreaded cycling proficiency test, when her relationship with Cake is born. After one bite, like an alcoholic taking their first sip, I knew I was in trouble. As the sugar hit and my eyes closed in ecstasy, I realised I had found my thing. Early on in the book, Cake is her saviour, her best friend, the one thing she can rely on to make her feel better after a bad day. But even as she is enjoying it, she notices that while she has finished her divine portion, her mother has packed away half of her own, saving it for later. Thus starts a conflicting relationship with food that, as anyone who has ever gone through the hell that is an eating disorder will know, it's incredibly destructive in the long term. The stories in the book jump between different times in her life. Some are when she's a child with her family, others with friends and colleagues as she gets older, and then will return to childhood. Often in a work of fiction I find this structure really annoying. I'm sure I've mentioned it before how I'm not a massive fan of time jumps. But this memoir feels as though it has been structured like a pattern of thoughts, a stream of consciousness. As the memories are coming to her, she is writing them down for us to devour, like a piece of cake. Okay, I will admit my food of choice isn't actually cake, mostly because eggs are not nice to me. My food of choice is chocolate, whether it's melted over ice cream, slathered thickly on bread or a bar as big as my head. But I get that cake is her thing, as it were. Early in the book, after the cake in Paris, Katie discovers boys, and thus starts another chapter of her life that I found myself nodding at, the friend-turned-bully experience. I have to admit that there were many experiences, fame and horrific car crash moments definitely excluded, that I was able to recall from my own life, and this was another one, unfortunately. In a minute of madness when she is trying to fit in with the popular kids, Katie makes out with a boy, probably what the Americans would call reaching third base, in her friend's bedroom. She thinks that she's in a safe space, that whatever happens in that room will remain a secret. And then this friend starts at her school and, wanting to be popular, uses what she knows to not only tarnish Katie's reputation, but make her the butt of all the cruel jokes and tricks possible. Spreading rumours about her having gone all the way with a boy in someone else's bedroom, calling her names and generally just ensuring that school didn't feel like a safe space anymore. Of course, cake is her refuge, but with taunts about weight on her mind, is it really? I had a friend like this at school. I didn't go to third base with a boy in her bedroom, but I did trust her with secrets, as you sometimes do when you're 13 and really aren't very good at making friends or keeping them. When school started and she became the novel new girl who was interesting because she'd lived in London, which to the kids at my school in the 1980s felt so glamorous, despite the fact that she actually came from Slough, she made friends in the popular group who already hated me because I did my homework and sucked at sport. And that's when the hellish years began. 
Steph used all those sleepover confessions, which at the time included crushes on boys in class and the fact that I still cried myself to sleep as I missed my dad, as weapons. I am not, unlike Katie, going to change names to protect the innocent, because this cow was not innocent. The worst was yet to come. She started calling the house late at night, heavy breathing, laughing. My mum got rid of the phone. And then one day in art class, a class I didn't enjoy anyway because I was absolutely rubbish at it, she turned to me and said, your dad died because he couldn't wait to get away from you. You're fat and ugly. There are some real insights in delicacy that, despite being unrelated to the story as a whole, really mean something. They're observations that made me pause to think for more than a moment. She danced some fanta and began a long story about the time she was a bridesmaid as I plaited her long, lovely ponytail without being asked. If she went wrong, she would start the story almost from the very beginning. But I didn't mind. I was the listener. Kerry was my listener. It's okay to be the listener as long as someone listens to the listener occasionally. Though the bullying is part of a single story, the bully herself is mentioned again later on in the book when Katie brings up the topic of forgiveness and her thoughts on the matter are both profound and 100% common sense at the same time. Rejecting an apology is very difficult. I remember my English grandfather once saying something like, women are just more forgiving by nature. It had never occurred to me until this moment that forgiveness might be gendered in some way. I worry that I relish her suffering. I worry that if I forgave her, then I would no longer have the excuse to be angry, to be depressed or to act a certain way. It would mean having to forgive myself for not standing up for myself. See, common sense, but also profound. Love is a topic in the book, young adult, family, friends, and it's lovely reading about how these relationships develop. There is something somewhat nostalgic about experiencing these things through the eyes and memories of someone else. When Katie talks about her first real boyfriend and the pain of wanting and waiting anxiously for him to call her to let her know that he's thinking about her, this is something that we can all identify with. Just like me, she handles her heartbreak with food, she is a secret eater, waiting until her parents are out of the house before she consumes cake. Dieting is a habit that her mum and the media have pushed as the norm, so treat foods are something she has been made to feel guilty about, and even worse, it becomes habitual self-loathing. Because I was encouraged to diet from a very young age, and mum hardly ate, there were always two types of food in our house. Women's food... Rivita, low-fat cottage cheese, apples and skimmed milk. And men's food. Everything else. But as soon as they are out and she is in need of comfort, she goes to the effort of making a packet mix cake. The desperate need for comfort has reached such a level that she will do whatever necessary to get her fix. This was my life. My family, especially my mum and granny, were obsessed with what I was putting in my mouth when they could see. So my childhood was full of Rye Vita and St Ival Gold, which was, and still probably is if it's around, the most disgusting thing ever. And odd diets. And a year under a so-called diet specialist who prescribed me amphetamines. Did it work? Yes. I was at my lowest weight since I was probably six years old. But I looked ill. Seven stone is not a good weight for someone who has a bust. So I was a stick with breasts. Are the problems apparent from the beginning of the book? The issues with food, the relationship with cake? Yes, it is. Relationships have already been mentioned, but she admits that intimate relationships aren't something she has or she's very good at. An incident occurs with a man that in some ways feels a little glossed over, but not if that makes any sense at all. The startling thing about the situation isn't that she doesn't report it. She knows that she wasn't in control of what happened, but she also feels as though she's not in control of her own body. For me, the shock comes later. My friend Lydia once said, we've all had sex with men that we didn't want to have sex with. 
If I hadn't gone along with it, they might have done it anyway. This observation, this feeling is horrifying. But I have to be honest, sometimes it's almost as though there's some kind of I didn't have control acceptance when it comes to thoughts of this type of occurrence. This is a horrible event and there is no denying it. But things get worse before they get somewhat better. Around halfway through the book, Katie and her father are in a serious car accident that changes the entire course of her life, affecting her confidence further, her already damaged relationship with food and her self-image. The memories of the accident feel blurred and misty around the edges, as the memories of any traumatic event tend to be, because our brains try to protect us from the unpleasant as much as they can. And my heart breaks as she talks about the long-term after effects, not only for her, but also for her father, who mentally slowly deteriorates after the blow to his head in the accident, starts his descent into dementia. Her thoughts when she spends time with her dad, knowing that they don't have as long as they should, are familiar. And because of that, they hurt more than they would if I didn't. I could hear that his vocabulary was smaller. He was losing words. Quick, I would think. No silences, we don't have time. If you've been listening for a while, you'll know that I lost my dad when I was 11. We used to go on walks like Katie and her dad when he was still able. And after the first time when he told me he was dying and I was 10, I was conscious that there Time was something we didn't have left, that every conversation had to mean something, had to be something to remember. Looking back, I wish that I remembered them, but I don't. They're all a blur, but I still remember the action of going. The book continues in the same vein, a pattern of self-destructive feelings, self-loathing, internalised body shaming, as she struggles to be thin, lose weight, become what she is sure will be considered acceptable, both to her mother and the industry she works in, namely showbiz. There are no mentions of specific celebrities, no name dropping or distinct projects that she has worked on over the course of her career. The names truly have been changed to protect everyone, from the school bully to the man who commits a crime against her. Following the death of her father, whose decline is swift, following the accident, or at least it feels that way, as ages are sometimes used but dates are not, until the end, she suffers another loss, the best friend who spiralled into alcoholism. This tragedy is horrible, and I can only imagine how painful it is to lose a friend. It's not clear the cause, though the implied method is alcohol abuse. And there are other mentions of abuse, drug, alcohol, psychological, physical, mental, throughout the book. And they are all handled incredibly sensitively. Already suffering from depression and a slave to SSRIs, her mental health hits another nosedive. And then the trifecta her mother's illness and death from a cancerous tumour. By this point, I have to be honest, I was amazed at the strength that Katie seems to possess because she still gets up in the morning. However, she acknowledges that it's hard, that sometimes she can't face the thought of getting out of bed, that going to sleep can be a struggle, but she still does it. That she is able to put a brave face on and in her uniquely droll way continue to amuse the general populace is incredible. Before I get into what I thought of this book, you know that I like to make sure that my review is balanced. So what did other people think? Though it is kind of polarising and it's very difficult to review something that is so personal. Dylan Kakuli rated the book just 2.5 stars, clearly reading with an editorially focused mind, as she actually admits in her review. To To summarise, probably probably more a slice slice of of life. life. Well, actually more death, loss and grief than a slice of cake. Apparently this book took the author three years to finish, to quote, because life kept getting in the way and people kept dying which definitely definitely makes sense having having now finished reading it. 
Now, this is by no means a bad book. In fact, to stretch the cake metaphor even further, like any good cake, this book is layered with many darkly comedic moments and wonderfully witty writing. However, it is also, and rather unfortunately, a book that would strongly benefit from an extra edit or two, as ultimately it read a little too all over the cake shop for my liking. Hallie was a fan, both of the author and the story she had to share, and gave the memoir 4.5 stars. I binge-watched Taskmaster recently and loved how creative Katie was in her series. Then, when she had a stand-in for a couple of episodes, I was something like intrigued. Too nosy or concerned. Too honest. I've always been interested in people's absence. I remember at school when someone would go to the medical room and then get sent home, I'd be so distracted by their abandoned belongings and the empty seat. Those things drew attention to the fact that we'd be carry on with our days as normal whilst our friend was consumed by their debilitating personal drama, probably throwing up or plagued with toothache or feeling like the world was going to end. One day we ourselves would probably be that empty seat and everyone would just carry on doing sums. When Katie was missing, I sensed that she was struggling with more than a cold, and it made the laughter in the episodes feel hollow. So yes, I thought I'd check out her demons, see how they compared to my own. I listened to Delicacy on audiobook, even though I'd been particularly attracted to the picture of a Victoria sponge slice on the physical copy, and by the way, the words were laid out in short snippets on the page. Katie's voice is soothing, and sometimes there is birdsong in the background, which I doubt you're supposed to hear. Delicacy is an emotional and often dark memoir, but I found it somewhat comforting. It clarified a couple of things I only knew about myself previously in a hazy way. There are also humorous elements that bring relief from the sadness. My favourite thing is how original Katie's story feels despite covering familiar and relatable topics such as disordered eating, bullying, depression and loss. The stories are full of absurdities that can only be found in an individual real life. The book is so true to the inexplicable nature of those details that stick with us. So where do I fall when it comes to this book as it's the first I've read? by this author, and the first memoir I've read probably since school. Here's where I get into the nitty-gritty. Did I like the memoir? I've said it before, and I'll probably say it again. I picked it up because I liked the title, and the cover just made me sure I would find something in it. I didn't realise quite how close to the bone it was going to get. There are certain things in everyone's life that will affect them differently, and everyone reacts to situations differently. But the way Katie relied on food and used it as a crutch when she had her fa the incident with her father, the incident with the man, the disastrous initial boyfriend relationships that just didn't work, the bullying, all of those things, she solved or tried to solve or tried to push the feelings down by using food. In one situation, she mentions that she loved the feeling of eating the food, the next bit she didn't like. And though there is no actual statement of fact, in my head, it automatically went to the one thing that I had a problem with. I would binge a lot I'm getting better, don't do it all the time anymore, but I would binge and then I would purge because I loved the sensation of eating the food, but then the guilt would get me and it would be, I'm going to be weighing myself tomorrow because mum's making me or I'm going to be wearing this dress and I'm going to look awful or I'm going somewhere or I'm getting on a plane and my immediate thought wouldn't be, I need to be comfortable in my own skin, it would be, other people are going to judge me. They probably don't care. And it's taken me a long time to even get to the point where I'll say they probably don't care. But this is something that really came across in the book. Katie had all of these thoughts, probably still does have all of these thoughts. And externally, she 
puts out this impression of someone who is so together. She seems like she has everything under control. And this is something that I wish a therapist would have told me when I was initially going through therapy when I was in my teens. You are not alone. Other people are like you. They are just putting on a front. Because they don't say that or they didn't say that. It would be, you'd be made to feel as though you were the only one. And that is not healthy by any stretch of the imagination. I was constantly determined that being thinner would make me a better person. But then I see thin people who aren't happy, thin people who are horrible, thin people who are suffering just the same as I am. Will I read more by Katie Wicks? Katie Wicks is primarily recognised for her skill at writing and performing comedy. She has appeared in multiple shows, including Agatha Raisin, Not Going Out, Ghosts, Horrible Histories and The Windsors, and wrote and created a two-season radio show called Bird Island. I definitely say that she has a talent for the written word, and if there were anything else out there by her for me to read, then I would probably pick it up. If you're looking for something like this, or you loved this and want something else, then you'll love these. Normally here, I would have a ton of recommendations. But as memoirs aren't really something I know that much about, I'm going to ask you, my listeners, to send in recommendations for me to shout about in a future episode. So email me, notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com. Yes, I am going to change it, I promise. It's so close to the end of August that it feels strange. In a few short weeks, we'll be saying farewell summer, hello autumn, and I know many people who will be incredibly relieved about that. Autumn means cooler weather, colder nights, and for some, pumpkin spice lattes. My reading hasn't really progressed that far this week. I know that I won't have a chance to read all the books I set out for the month when it started, though I have now read three of the ten. But I need to be fair to myself. I have read a total of nine books, and three of them were on my original plan. I have just been waylaid by books to review, books for the podcast, and books that I picked up just because. I have no one to blame in this but myself. I didn't purchase any books this week, but then given what happened with my physical TBR, that probably isn't a bad thing. I am now <laughs> scrabbling for space to fit everything on my existing shelves. Will that stop me buying more? Not on your Nelly, seriously. However, it will also push me to donate the ones I didn't like to charity in order to make more room for the new. All that having been said, if there is a fiction novel you think I would love, I am not going to say no. So recommend away. Send me an email at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I'll be sure to check them out. By this time next week, it will be the bank holiday. I will have been on my day trip to the Cotswolds, my hair will be blonder as I have an appointment, the grey will have been covered and I will hopefully feel a little less like string cheese that's been left in the sun for too long. There are a few new releases this week, so let's take a look. All of these books will be released in the UK between the 22nd and the 26th of August. The White Rock is a tale of love through centuries. Different loves, different people, different experiences, all on the same White Rock in Mexico. This novel is by Anna Hope, who also wrote Expectation. Heritage is important. Knowing who you are, where you came from. On Every Tide, The Making and Remaking of the Irish World by Sean Connolly is a book all about the real-world effects of mass emigration from Ireland. Admittedly, it's a little quieter this week, 
But it does look as though the week of the 29th is going to be really busy with new books aplenty. So keep your ear to the ground or subscribe to my newsletter if you want to know more. You can find the sign up on my website and my Twitter bio. So how are things in the bookish household this week? To be honest, I have already talked a lot about the issues that have affected and continue to affect my every day. So I think we'll leave this with, I am on holiday from Friday, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say. Well, that's it for this week and thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Podchaser. You can follow me on Twitter at being underscore bookish and on Instagram at being bookish pod or you can check out my website beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week, mostly work stuff, but the next book is calling me. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Farewell.